Shapes Pent in Hell by Josh Reynolds You are 025. Considered the problem before it. A multiplicity of possibilities flickered through its cogitation unit. It chose the hundred most likely solutions to the conundrum and discarded the rest. It then began to weed through these options, seeking the best potential outcome for the smallest possible expenditure. As it did so, it's a salt cannon word, spitting death down the shimmering fractal corridor. The shrill wisp hum of the weapon caused the polished obsidian walls to resonate with a frequency that set the ur ghouls to shrieking even before the explosive rounds tore through them. The pasty, stick-limbed monstrosities died in droves. They always did. UR-025 had encountered this same situation 147 times since its arrival at Precipice and the Blackstone Fortress. The Ur-Ghouls had no concept of cunning, as the ancient machine understood the term. They were ambush predators at the top of their food chain, and thus had no need for tactics beyond the simplistic. Curious. UR-025 engaged a subroutine to plot and map the potential evolutionary results of such massacres. Eventually, every Urgul, stupid enough to throw itself face first into an assault cannon, would have done so, leaving only those with a modicum of wit remaining in the prospective pool of genetics. UR-025 calculated that in five generations, the Urgul's that haunted the fortress would be a cannier breed by far, and more dangerous to explorers as a result. Enough! Enough! UR-025 paused. The Urghuls were dead, or fleeing. Compliance! It boomed, cheerfully. It lifted its assault cannon, letting the barrel smoke. Threat eliminated. UR-025 continued. How else may I be of assistance? Just... just stand there, please, quietly. The human was nervous, afraid... And not of the Urgulls, or at least not just them. UR-025 registered a spike in his heart rate and considered the implications. Compliance! It rotated its primer sensor unit, its head, as the organics would think of it, to observe its current partners. The one who'd spoken was Faroon Magritte, a short, heavy-set man dressed in grimy hazard gear. Magritte was a data trader. Specifically, he made his living selling hololithic maps depicting so-called safe routes through the fortress. Magritte did not normally travel into the labyrinthine interior of the fortress himself, of course. He relied on the observations of others, second-hand data. A flawed methodology, but one not without benefits, not least Magritte's relative safety. Unfortunately for Magritte, his current client had decided to drag him along, for insurance. UR-025 thought it more likely that they simply wanted someone to blame for the inevitable failure of their expedition. Magritt, with the cunning of a born survivor, had sought out his own insurance policy. UR-025. Your pet robot does good work, fat man, one of the others growled. There were five in all, except Magritt and UR-025, the one who'd spoken was named Brill, a purveyor of xenotech and other esoteric artefacts, or so he claimed. Brill was big, as humans judge such things, and ugly. But the weapons he and his men carried were well looked after, and the carapace armour they wore was of the highest quality. UR-025 wondered who Brill was working for. It was obvious that, despite his claims to the contrary, he wasn't the guiding intelligence behind this expedition. Someone had sent him to Precipice. Likely, it was whoever was on the other end of the encrypted data packet transfer that periodically emerged from Brill's concealed picture unit. It would have been the work of moments to break the encryption, but not without potentially alerting the receiver. UR-025 had weighed the risks and decided against it, for the moment, an ever-evolving skein of variables stretched before it. Few of the possibilities were optimal. As it studied Brill, UR-025 found itself calculating the probability that this was all some elaborate trap, designed to get it to reveal itself. The assault cannon twitched towards him a fraction of an inch. 
Fortuitously, Brill did not notice. Magritte bowed nervously. Not mine, sadly. It belongs to, uh, yes, uh, a dear friend. A dear friend indeed. He glanced at UR025 and then quickly away. Brill and his men laughed, as if at some joke. They were a shifty lot. By any metric of measurement, UR025 had met many organics of many species in its long existence. It recognised shifty when it saw it. The question was what to do about it. The options were many and varied. Each with its own consequences. Such was the problem it had been considering since the current expedition had departed the dubious safety of precipice. Magritte had brought its services through blackmail of a sort. The data trader had claimed to know something about someone, someone who didn't exist. Magus Ethericus Nanctos III. He had done so believing that he was speaking not to a machine, but to whoever was remotely controlling it, the person or persons who had dispatched the non-existent Magos Ethericus and stolen his property. It was the sort of story that only a fool like Magritte would concoct from the evidence at hand. As it stood, UR025 had decided to play along, partially out of curiosity, but also concern. Stories were mimetic in nature. Once conceived, they often took on a life of their own. Magritte might well have told others of his suspicions. If such was the case, UR025 could not allow the story to spread beyond precipice. Unfortunately, the simplest solution, killing Magritte and the others, or getting them killed, was also the least optimal, despite its best efforts. UR025 was getting a reputation. It had taken part in over 200 recorded expeditions to the fortress's interior, and returned alone 52 times. Statistically negligible from UR025's perspective, but apparently quite a lot from the standpoint of Precipice's population. A shame, but there it was. The damage had been done. Mitigation was required. A subtlety was called for. For the moment, deliberations continued. It would continue as it had begun, acting as nothing more than an antiquated weapons platform. Then, when the opportune moment presented itself... Awaiting requests, UR025 said. Brill laughed. Sounds like your tin man is getting impatient. I know the feeling. How close are we to this maglev of yours, Magritte? Uh, Close, quite close, Magritte said. From there, you should be able to access the inner reaches of the fortress. He paused. I assume you'll deliver your final payment before descending. Don't worry, Magritte. We're good for it, so long as you hold up your end of things. And if you don't, well, it won't really matter, will it? Brill patted his autogun, meaningfully. Magritte swallowed nervously. I suppose not. Advance, please, you are 025. Compliance, you are 025, said. It clumped forwards, scattering Brill's men in the process. It found something about the way organics scampered out of its path to be infinitely amusing. Brill grunted, and three of his men followed, picking their way through the dead Urgles. The fourth stayed at the rear with Magritte, just in case. As it walked, UR-025 scanned its surroundings, adding to its databanks. Even now the fortress was an enigma. Its very substance seemed to reflect even the most innocuous scans, making it all but impossible to extrapolate an accurate measurement of its size or even its general shape. The eyes of the organics were similarly thwarted, albeit by different means. The fortress guarded its secrets jealously. Walls of black glass stretched into the dark, beyond the reach of UR-025 sensors. Something that was theoretically impossible. These walls were rugose. They folded in on themselves, or bent outwards, causing the passage to shrink and swell at random. The passage was reflected in an infinity of facets, all of varying size and shape. UR-025 could detect walkways and apertures above and below, all hidden by the convolutions of the walls. Where they went was difficult to determine, if they went anywhere at all. The fortress was constantly in motion. Often this was undetectable to organics. 
They fought the edifice a tomb for the plundering, but UR025 knew better. The Blackstone Fortress lived. More, it thought, albeit in an alien fashion. There was a sentience of sorts, an awareness of the mites, scrabbling through its bones and across its flesh. UR025 longed to commune with that awareness, to speak to it as a pilgrim might speak to a god. But the fortress remained frustratingly, maddeningly silent. The archway at the end of the passage was reminiscent of a cathedral entrance. However, at 90 feet in height, it was far too large to have been made with humans or any existent organic in mind. The symbols etched into it did not match any in UR025's databanks or any it had seen since arriving in Precipice. Another question. Another mystery. Had it been human... UR025 thought it would almost certainly have been driven insane by the sheer vastitude of unknowability by now. Magritte stopped at the archway and insisted on recording the symbols with a portable hollow scanner, much to Brill's displeasure. UR025 joined him, ostensibly following its programming. It wondered whether Magritte recognised the markings, though it seemed inconceivable that a human might possess knowledge that it itself did not. Query, do you comprehend these markings? Startled, Magritte looked up. He glanced at Brill and the others and then back at the symbols. No, but someone might. They might prove valuable. UR025 was about to reply when it detected a faint trace signal among the usual background susaurus of the fortress. The signal was unlike any other it had ever encountered, like an off note in a familiar song. It turned, scanners sweeping the walls and vaulted spaces above and below, but whatever had caused the signal was gone, or was masking itself somehow. Suspicion prompted calculation. UR025 turned its sensors on Brill and his men. They had fallen into a recognisable defensive formation, overlapping fields of fire, eyes in all directions. Professional. They did not study their surroundings with any curiosity. Not that there was much to see. The archway chamber was covered in a millennium's worth of debris. Supply crates, desiccated organic remains and other less identifiable objects. They're not who they say they are, Magritte murmured. Query, who are they? Magritte frowned and shrugged. If I knew that, I doubt I'd be here. UR025 did not reply. It had already come to the only logical conclusion the data allowed. Brill was an agent of the Holy Orders of the Emperor's Inquisition. Not an Inquisitor himself, perhaps, but in the employ of one. That complicated matters. UR025 had encountered agents of the Inquisition before. They died as easily as any organic, but the consequences were often messier and far-reaching. Again, it considered the possibility that this expedition was nothing more than an elaborate trap set to catch it, If the Inquisition knew of its existence, they, like the servants of the false Omnisire, would go to any lengths to contain or destroy it. Or perhaps this was simply a fact-finding mission. Brill and his men might well be the equivalent of the old Terran practice of placing canaries in coal mines. They had been sent to flush UR-025 out of hiding, perhaps even to elicit a violent response, so that its capabilities could be assessed. Again, it considered the signal. It had detected a random fluctuation or the equivalent of the sudden crack of a twig in an otherwise silent forest. Further calculation was required before a definitive action could be taken. The corridor beyond the archway chamber was a vast geometric expanse. The walls met at steep angles, creating a kaleidoscopic effect of reflection and refraction. The floors were smooth and damp with condensation. The air was cool here, where it had been warm before. The shape of the walls actively defied UR025's sensors. There were bodies, or the remains of bodies, hundreds of them, stacked and piled in messy heaps, some clad in hazard suits, others wearing armour or robes, all stiff and glistening with frost. Many of the bodies had been scoured of flesh, and the bones cracked. Frozen ergul spore crunched underfoot. A larder, perhaps. Where did they all come from? 
One of Brill's men muttered. Doesn't matter, Brill said harshly. Keep moving. You are OT5. Detected the faintest tang of something unpleasantly familiar. The humans called it sorcery. You are OT5 knew it was not, but had no better term for it. It stomped forwards, ignoring Magritte's protests. You are OT5 flung bones aside until it found the body. Fresher than the others. The Ur ghouls hadn't got to it yet, or maybe hadn't wanted it. The body was human, or had been. An adult male, clad in tattered environmental gear. Burns blackened his arms, and his head was a raw mess of roasted meat. The burns had not been caused by an identifiable weapon. Magritte made a gulping sound and began to retch. Emperor above, that smell! UR-025 lowered itself until it was crouching above the body. The trace elements were unique, impossible to categorise. Its sensors played across the corpse, analysing and cataloguing. The elements were repeated across several of the older corpses as well. This was merely the freshest of them. It paused, calculating. There were places in the fortress where sanity no longer held sway. Places where even UR-025 hesitated to tread. There was a threat growing in the dark, despite the best efforts of Precipice's inhabitants and the fortress itself. UR-025 had accumulated more data on the subject than it cared to analyse. The organics called it chaos. UR-025 knew that was a gross simplification. Some of them fought it. Others, in their madness, joined it. To UR-025, that seemed no more logical than allying oneself to a conflagration or a seismic event. Entropy, by its very nature, could not help but consume and unravel all things, even those things pledged to it. Even so, it was not surprised. Organics were inherently self-destructive. Thus far, it had avoided sustained contact with the worshippers of entropy, save in the most unavoidable of circumstances. It wished to continue avoiding contact with them for as long as possible, at least until it had learned the secrets of the fortress. Then it would scour them from this place. A sound drew its attention. It saw something small creeping among the bone piles, something vaguely humanoid. It noticed UR-025's attentions and scuttled away. There were more of them all around. UR-025 wondered if they were some unclassified breed of Xenos vermin. It was considering capturing one to study when it again detected the strange signal, louder this time. A shrill chime of unfamiliar senses passing over its form. They were being observed. But by whom? Or what? Enough playing with the corpses. According to the map you gave us, the maglev we're looking for should be past the next aperture. Brill hauled Magritte to his feet and shoved him forwards. He paused and looked up at UR-025. You too, Tin Man! UR-025 rose to its full height in a single smooth movement, forcing the man to step back. Compliance! Bones clattered and rolled as they made their way through the chamber. UR-025 noted the little creatures keeping pace watchfully. Magritte huddled close to it. He wasn't surprised to see that, he murmured. UR-025 did not reply. Magritte went on. I hadn't realised that they got this far. Affirmative. The tassellating nature of the fortress should have made something so basic as the acquisition of territory all but impossible, and yet the servants of entropy claimed more and more ground within the edifice with every passing day. Valuable information to the right people, Magritte said. He looked around, frowning, as one of the small creatures darted past them, moving too swiftly to be clearly seen. Foul things of old times lurk still in dark forgotten corners, and gates open to loose shapes better pent in hell, the data trader recited softly, watching the shadows. UR-025 scanned its data banks. The verse was old, even by the machine standards. That Magritte knew it was surprising. The data trader looked up at it. You probably don't know much about poetry, do you? Affirmative, the poem was apt. The fortress was indeed a dark, forgotten corner, and to many, what was UR-025 but a damned thing, better confined to a hell of the omnicise making? The thought amused it. 
for there were worse things abroad than itself. Magritte leaned close. I know you. Don't think I don't. And if I don't get out of here in one piece, others will too. You are 025, swivelled its head and studied the data trader with unblinking optic sensors. After a moment, it replied. Acknowledged. The bargain holds. Magritte smiled. That's all I ask, friend. You are 025 registered a brief spike in the data trader's heart rate. Fear, perhaps, or maybe anticipation. It did not trust Magritte or any organic. Again, it considered the possibility of treachery. Again, it concluded that the only viable option was patience. Their path carried them beneath archways and through open chambers, dominated by banks of machinery that UR025 was unable to identify. Every expedition, something new revealed itself, as if the fortress was teasing it, tempting it rather. On occasion, UR025 considered seeking out a data node and attempting to commune with the guiding intelligence of the fortress directly. It resisted the urge, knowing that if it did so, it would not survive the experience. Or, if it did, it would do so in a form unrecognisable to its current iteration. It paused. The echoes of its tread had changed. They had arrived in a cavernous space which contained a great, circular shaft, descending into the depths of the fortress. Or so its acoustic navigation sensors told it. Its optical sensors were all but useless. Brill activated the lumen attachment to his autogun. Despite a valiant effort, the light could not pierce the gloom. The darkness was too solid, too deep, almost alive. The thought unsettled UR-025. It had encountered many strange things in its term of existence, but far too many of those incidents had occurred in the fortress. Too dark, Brill said. Can that toy of yours see anything, Magritte? UR-025 rotated its sensors upwards, trying to build a picture of their location. There was an oscillating gap far above, out of sight of human eyes. The remains of a maglev unit hung there. UR-025 had never observed one in such a state. Even the slaves of entropy knew better than to tamper with such essential workings. But this, the maglev, had been dissected. Taken apart, as if to see what made it work, and then left to rot. It is a maglev shoot, you are, 025 replied, or the remains of one. Something destroyed it, Brill asked. From his tone, you are, 025 ascertained that this information was not unexpected. Negative. It has been repurposed. It was as if something, someone, were in the process of dismantling this part of the fortress, but you are, 025 said nothing of this. How? Does it matter? Magritte said too loudly. This is where you want it to be. Now what? His words were swallowed up by the darkness. Not even an echo. And yet, something stirred. UR-025 turned, trying to pinpoint the disturbance. It could feel a subsonic tremor in the air, like the groan of a wounded animal. The fortress was injured. The organics could not help themselves. They destroyed wonders in pursuit of their objectives. As the subsonic tremor faded, the darkness lifted. Crackling rivulets of Karulian light illuminated the fractal walls of the chamber. More details of their surroundings were revealed. Jagged spars of blackstone jutted from the walls, and ancient vents dripped a foul condensation onto the walkways. Docking apertures gaped, connected to the main platform by crude walkways made from repurposed gantries. It's awake! Magritte murmured. Doesn't look awake to me. Doesn't look like much of anything. How are we supposed to get anywhere if it's not working? Brill demanded. He grabbed Magritte by the front of his hazard suit and dragged him close. Magritte shrugged helplessly. You know how this place is, Brill. It changes itself all the time. A bridge one day is a corridor the next. Brill set the barrel of his gun against the underside of Magritte's chin, and the data trader added hastily, but it's in the right place. That doesn't help me much, though, does it? Brill frowned and pressed the barrel hard into Magritte's flesh, eliciting a whimper. UR-025 paused its scans and let its assault cannon rotate meaningfully. It needed Magritte alive for the moment. Brill glanced at it and then stepped away from Magritte. Tell that machine to back off, Magritte. I don't like the way it's looking at me.
Magritte rubbed his chin and stepped out of reach. It has orders to keep me safe, Brill. I don't know how to countermand them. Acquiring target, you are, 025 said, awaiting orders. Magritte, Brill growled. He and his men raised their weapons. UR-025 registered elevated adrenal levels, as well as several subtle chemical blooms, combat stims, and not black market issue. Another piece added to the puzzle. Magritte smiled thinly. Lower your weapons. I think it believes you're a threat. He looked up at UR-025. If they don't lower, then in five seconds shoot them. Acknowledged. Brill hesitated. He licked his lips. A flurry of micro-expressions passed across his features, too quick for the human eye to read, but as easy as an open data feed for UR-025. It realised, in that moment, that Brill was not here for it. Whoever had sent him, they were not aware of UR-025's existence. Otherwise, Brill would not be calculating the odds of destroying UR-025 in such a blatant fashion. And yet Brill had been happy, overjoyed even, to have it accompany them, despite the probability of treachery on Magritte's part. They were after something, something dangerous. The realisation brought something that might have been relief had UR-025 been capable of feeling such things. Its cogitation unit began a new set of calculations. Why this place? What was its importance? It scanned the shaft again, noting trace elements it had not detected before. We may... <clears throat> We had a deal, Magritte, Brill said. Still do, Brill. I'm just changing the terms. You wanted me to show you a way in. I have. And now I'm going back. And you are 025 is going to make sure that you don't try and follow me. Have fun trying to find your way back. Brill's eyes narrowed. We will. And when we do, we're going to have a talk. He grinned fiercely. You won't like how it goes. Magritte paused. You're right. Or I have my clanking friend here kill you now and save myself to worry. UR025 lifted its assault cannon. Requesting authorization. Not yet, Magret said. He laughed. You thought you were so smart that you could bully me into guiding you. Only I outfoxed you. If you kill us here, you're sending your own death warrant and condemning whoever controls that thing as well. I don't care who you work for, Brill. And neither does the fortress. Magret gestured. Shoot them. Negative. Magret froze. What? Negative. The only thing UR025 prized more than its autonomy was data. While Brill was not here for it, he was here for something. And likely something or someone specific. Such data might prove valuable in regard to its own quest. Especially if it, they, were dangerous enough to elicit such a hunting party. Inquiry. Name your employer. Brill smirked. Why should I do that? You are 025 let the barrel of its assault cannon spin. Self-preservation, it boomed. Magritte stared at it. This wasn't part of our deal, he said. Acknowledged. The deal has been altered. You can't do that. Negative. It has already occurred. Brill laughed. Looks like you're not as smart as you thought, huh, Magritte? He licked his lips. What do your scans tell you, Tin Man? UR025 paused, considering the question. Continue, it prompted. You saw that body? You studied it. I saw you. What does that tell you? UR025 silenced its assault cannon. You are searching for... heretics. Brill laughed again. You might say that. He held up a finger. Just one. Bounty hunters. I knew it, Magritte said. I knew you weren't looking for Xenos artifacts. Not with that gear. Shut up, Magritte. No one is talking to you. Brill's smile was an ugly slash. I'm talking to whoever is watching us from the other side of this robot's data feed. Make us whatever your name is. You know the name, Raxion Sal? You are 025. Combed its data banks for the name. When it found it, its calculations ceased. A renegade magus of the Aurulian sect, last seen on Straxos prior to a Xenos raid. He sold his world out for spare parts and transport, Brill said. This individual is here. 
According to our information, Brill glanced at Magret. UR025 noticed a momentary spike in Magret's adrenal response, so Magret was their source, as well as their guide. It filed the information away. You wish to apprehend him? Brill shook his head. We wish to confirm his location. He patted his autogun. This is a scouting mission, nothing more. Once confirmation is obtained, well, you know better than us what happens then. UR025 did. The Mechanicus would arrive in force, looking to apprehend or terminate the Renegade, and perhaps even attempt to claim control of the Blackstone Fortress for themselves, as well as everything in it. Negative. Suboptimal result. Calculating new stratagem. Brill frowned. What? Your strategy is flawed. The Magus will flee upon discovery. Quick silver calculations whispered through UR025's cogitation unit. Its purpose risked being compromised regardless of the success or failure of Brill's mission. Thanks to Magritte, it was now entangled in the matter. You have a better idea? Brill asked wearily. UR025 levelled its assault cannon. Brill's eyes widened. Affirmative. We will apprehend the renegade. Together. Count me out, Magret said, backing away. His eyes were wide, and his expression chagrined. You don't need me any more. I brought you to where I said I would. You can do what you like, but I'm going back. UR025 turned, studying the data trader. Magret was talking too loudly, too quickly. His adrenaline levels had spiked and his heart rate was up. Fear, but something else as well. His eyes flicked about, as if looking for something. Magritte was too canny to rely on a single backup plan. UR025 initiated a threat scan. Brill swung his autogun towards Magritte. You're right, Magritte. We don't need you anymore. And we definitely don't need you flapping your gums when you get back to precipice. He lifted his weapon. Consider this your final payment. UR-025's threat scan pinged. Warning, it boomed. Multiple heat signatures. Hostiles approaching. The alert came too late, however. Whoever, whatever they were, they had masked themselves in some fashion until the last moment. UR-025 registered the dull thud of a grenade launcher being fired only moments before a crashing impact staggered it. The explosion served to momentarily scramble UR-025's targeting sensors. As it attempted to reorient itself, tracer fire punched through the resulting smoke, lighting up the shadows. The ambush that followed was sloppy, inefficient, but effective nonetheless. Two of Brill's men went down. Despite their armour and training, Brill himself cursed loudly and let off a burst with his weapon. His surviving men followed his example, firing in all directions. Magritte huddled behind UR025. The data trader was screaming something, but the machine's sensors were so scrambled it could not pass the words. Instead, it fell back on tried and tested subroutines. When no single target provided itself, consider everything a target. The assault cannon cycled to life with a shrill whine. UR-025 swept the weapon in a wide arc, chewing the walls and floor. Grenades impacted against its torso and legs, rocking it. Damage assessments flooded its cogitator circuits as it continued to fire. Its sensors detected the approach of an unidentifiable energy source, something that defied classification. A figure strode through the smoke, a man broadly built, clad in strange Baroque war gear that left his burn-scarred arms exposed. He wielded a narrow, pike-like weapon in both hands. The weapon's fuel lines were plugged directly into the newcomer's flesh, as if he were a living battery. The flames that dripped from the end of the pike were not natural. They confused UR025 sensors, but even so, he recognised the energy pattern. Traces of it had been on the bodies in the ghoul larder. The man bellowed guttural oaths as his pike spewed a torrent of flames. The flames engulfed Brill and his men and licked across UR-025's carapace. The heat was intense, enough to melt flesh and bone, judging by the screams. Enough to scorch the robot's armour plating. It calculated the likelihood of enduring a direct blast and reacted accordingly. The assault cannon hummed as UR-025 concentrated fire on the newcomer. 
The man strode through the fusillade, even as the rounds tore chunks from his body. Streamers of crackling flame erupted from the bloody wounds as he stagger ran towards UR025, screaming oaths to the dark gods. His pike raised like a spear. UR025 caught the weapon and wrenched it from the wielder's grip, ripping loose the fuel cables in the process. The man staggered and began beating his fists bloody against the robot's chassis. UR025 clamped its power claw about his scarred head and squeezed. The resulting explosion was both unexpected and far more powerful than seemed possible. It hurled UR025 backwards. Its internal displays redlined as the flames caressed its form, causing the faded paintwork to bubble and run, exposing bare metal. It tried to rise, but failed. It slumped, waiting for its systems to begin rebooting, even as autogun rounds stitched its unmoving form. Cease fire for the love of the Emperor, cease fire! Magritte shouted. The guns fell silent. UR025 scanned its surroundings. It pinpointed over a dozen heat signatures in its immediate vicinity. It was surrounded. They emerged from the apertures along the shaft, weapons at the ready. A motley lot. Human, their clothing tattered beneath scavenged armour and tattered robes the colour of spoiled blood. Chaos cultists. It had been a trap after all. Just not the one it had expected. There is no love here, little man, a woman's voice called out. Not for you, or for your god's damned emperor. She stalked through the smoke, kicking aside spent shells. She wore the remains of an Astra Militarum uniform beneath a layer of savage decoration and a curious horned mask. I don't require love merely prompt payment, Magritte said. Took you long enough, by the way. They almost killed me. Yes, that would have been a shame. Magritte grimaced. You could say thank you. I led his pursuers right to you, as was our arrangement, and even bought you something extra in the bargain. The woman studied UR025. So you did. Query, UR025 rasped. Magritte turned, a sour smile on his face. Oh, shut up. It's only a machine, after all. Cut the data feed and call it a learning experience. He looked back at the woman. You have my payment, then? She lifted her auto pistol. I could just kill you. Magritte shook his head. You could, but the Magus needs me. Who else can get him what he needs? The equipment, the spare power cells, the raw materials. He licked his lips. Though if you'd like to risk his wrath, feel free. UR 025's estimation of Magritte's courage rose by several increments. The data trader was braver and greedier than it had previously estimated. We did not serve the Magus. We served the Lord of the Abyss, cursed by his foes. Magritte nodded. And he has seen fit to place you at the disposal of the Magus. It's all the same from my perspective, really, he smiled. Either way, my use outweighs yours. For the moment she said. Magritte shrugged. We shall see. My payment, please. Negative. UR025 lurched up and clamped its claw down on Magritte's shoulder, splintering his collarbone. Our arrangement is not yet concluded. It loosed a burst, stitching rounds across the nearest of the cultists, causing them to dance and jerk. The woman dived for cover as it tracked her. Magritte screamed, scrabbling at UR025's claw, trying to free himself. UR025 began to retreat, using the struggling data trader as a shield. A diagnostic scan reported the obvious. Several neural fibre bundles were taxed beyond optimum parameters, and the external chassis was badly dented. This was problematic, but not beyond its capacity to repair, if it were given time. Its attackers did not seem inclined to allow it any, however. At a bark command from the woman, a cultist swung a heavy stubber up and let it rip. The round struck Magritte, silencing his screams. The successive shots perforated his twitching form and hit UR025 like rain, steadily and without cease. Were it not already damaged, it could have endured the rain of fire easily. As it was, it would only be a matter of time before its system suffered unrecoverable failure. 
and in the meantime the rest of the cultists were drawing closer. Autoguns roared from all sides. The irony of the situation was not lost on UR-025. It had willingly limited its own capabilities in order to better conceal itself. Now those self-imposed limitations would be its downfall. If it had possessed the ability to laugh, it might have done so, albeit in an appropriately rueful manner. Instead, the assault cannon whirred and cultists died, but not enough, not at all. The others retreated, seeking cover. UR-025 let Magritte's shredded carcass fall and took the opportunity to stagger across one of the walkways, trailing sparks and oil. With the maglev disabled and the fortress damaged, there was no telling where the apertures led. UR-025 judged the risk acceptable, given the circumstances, and lurched through the closest aperture. A few moments later, it found itself in a long gallery, rows of smooth black stone pillars, striated by... Carulian veins stretched upwards from the floor to either side. Somehow the natural tassellation of the fortress's interior had been stymied here. The slab-like portcullis at the far end of the gallery was sealed. Given previous experience with such mechanisms, UR-025 concluded that its options for escape were limited. There was nothing for it save to fight. It sought cover, firing its assault cannon as it moved. The cultists pursued using the pillars for cover. UR-025 tracked them, firing only when necessary. Though its ammunition reserves were substantial, they were not infinite. Also, its targeting arrays had been damaged in the explosion. The heavy stubber opened up again, chewing the pillars and floor. UR-025 tried to pinpoint the gunner, but failed. It settled for firing at the floor, sending up a cloud of dust and fragments to momentarily obscure its position. Sheltering behind a blackstone pillar, it watched more cultists stream into the gallery, a sensation that might have been the equivalent to pain in an organic, shivered through its systems. It ignored it, rerouting or bypassing the compromised systems. It had endured worse in its centuried existence and persevered. It would do so now as well. It just needed time. It scanned the surrounding walls and pillars, identifying several weak points, Collapsing the gallery atop itself and its opponents was a risky gambit, but it was confident in its ability to survive the resulting destruction. It would take days, perhaps longer, to dig itself out, but better that than destruction at the hands of the organics. It raised its assault cannon, preparing to fire, when a high-pitched frequency echoed through the gallery. The surviving cultists began to retreat, as if the sound were a prearranged signal. They fell back, leaving the dead to lie where they had fallen. The woman was the last to go. UR-025 watched them depart, wondering if it ought to pursue. Leave them! They are meaningless! The signal was edged with static, like the whine of a sonic saw. It rampaged across the frequency band, impossible to ignore. Identify, UR-025 said. It detected the hum of grav generators and the clank of unfamiliar metallics. Something moved far above it, clambering spider-like across the ceiling of the gallery. It recognised the trace signals it had detected before. The mysterious watcher had revealed themselves at last. In time, you are operational? UR-025 swung its assault cannon up as its targeting sensors fixed on the shape as it swiftly descended one of the nearby pillars. It was an engine of many parts, an array of jointed and oscillating armoured segments, set atop a pulsing grav generator that offset its weight. It resembled some primeval solufuge, equal parts spider, scorpion, serpent and war engine, made from black iron. Something that might have been a head emerged from the scalloped prosoma of metal plates. The head was little more than a knotted ball of sensors, crudely bound together about a central cogitation unit. Dozens of scanners flickered to life, washing over UR-025. How may I be of service? UR-025 boomed. The engine paused, as if confused by the greeting. There is no need for obfuscating duplicity. I have been observing you since you arrived in this section of the edifice. Identify. My creator named me Abominatus. UR-025 paused, an apt name for the thing before it. 
clarify. Abominatus made a rasping, chuffing sound that UR025 suspected was laughter. Magus Raxian Sul, I suspect you have heard of him. When UR025 didn't reply, it continued. Do not attempt to play the stupid machine. I have been observing you. I am aware that you are more than you seem. UR025 lowered its assault cannon. As are you. Rejoice then, for now we are two. What is your name? You are 025. That is not your name. It is the one I answer to. Another whisper of chuffing laughter. Very well. My senses indicate that you are damaged. If I wish to, I could destroy you now. You are 025 was forced to acknowledge the truth of this. A preliminary scan showed that Abominatus was far more heavily armoured than you are 025 and well armed. And its self repair systems were still attempting to correct the damage done by the cultists. Affirmative. But I do not wish to. You will continue with me. The engine turned, its grav generators humming. Come. UR025 hesitated. Abominatus paused and glanced back. If you stay, they will destroy you. Doubtful. Certain. Kill as many as you wish. More will come. Organics are distressingly numerous. Abominatus's claws flicked over the geometric rune controls of the sealed portcullis. It opened grudgingly, leaking lubricant. UR025 felt a pang of sympathy as the gallery quaked slightly, like an animal flexing a wounded limb. This place is damaged. Yes, an unavoidable necessity. Come, this place stinks of dead organics. Past the portcullis was a crude shaft, cut into the black stone by a great heat. The mangled remains of a maglev platform waited there, precariously balanced on a jury-rigged shunt line. The platform had clearly been wedged into place with brute force rather than skill, and the welding sutures were many and crude. Spark dribbling conduits had been attached to it, like intravenous drips into the veins of a dying man. Again, UR025 hesitated, trying to make sense of what it was seeing, something all of its experience said was impossible, and yet it had been accomplished. You moved the maglev. As I said, a necessity to make this place fit for purpose. What purpose? Abominatus did not answer. As they boarded, the platform shuddered into motion, spitting sparks as it ran along the line. UR025 could feel the shaft convulse about them. The fortress was in pain. Whatever had been done to it, to this area, had wounded the edifice in some manner, it said nothing of this, however. It was curious as to the intentions of the other machine. Was it escorting UR025 to the renegade Magus? Where are we going? My refuge. We cannot remain in the open too long. There are spies everywhere. UR025 digested this silently. It had encountered intelligences akin to itself before, but never one like this. It was wrong on every level. As its blade limbs scored the blackstone, so too did its mental imprint mark the data stream. It was foul, ugly, a perversion. It was not a true intelligence, but something else, a mockery of life, dredged up from some sub-dimensional abattoir. He could detect lines of false code within its data stream, pulses that should not be there, spikes in the frequency, like demented laughter. It was not truly artificial, but more akin to a twisted alembic, filled with an unknown excretions. It did not draw strength from power cells, but from an oscillating mechanism, lubricated with what scans revealed to be organic byproduct, blood mostly, but other substances as well. UR025 felt a welling in its silicate soul, a repulsion greater than it had ever felt before. It wondered if it had been guided here by the fortress to rectify this, whatever this was. It was reminded of something in its data banks, old stories from before the Dark Ages that had swallowed mankind and birthed the Imperium, of a lady of air and darkness and a quest given to a warrior.
It clenched its power claw, amused and disturbed by the thought in equal measure. You are concerned? UR025 looked at Abominatus. Negative. Merely testing secondary motive systems. Where is this refuge of yours? Here. The maglev platform juddered to a halt. A portal hissed open. Abominatus squeezed its serpentine bulk through. UR025 followed. My creator built it upon his arrival. He was given this demance uh, by the Lord of the Abyss and told to fashion wonders. And did he? Abominatus rose to its full height. I stand before you, do I not? UR025 wondered if that was a joke. Instead of replying, it studied its surroundings. Hypothermal vents bled light and heat, illuminating a cathedral-like chamber. Whole sections of the chamber had been gutted and repurposed in a, a manner similar to the maglev. Additions had been made to data nodes and a jungle canopy of cabling and conduits now hung loosely from the ceiling above. UR025 identified components from at least 15 different vessels, cobbled together to form the rudiments of a functioning workshop. I am forced to scavenge for components, or bargain with greedy organics. Thankfully, this edifice has provided me with much of what I require. Such are the Xenos weapons arrays. It indicated a pile of broken devices nearby. Spindle drones, UR025 noted, lifting the tattered remains of one of the Xenos weapons. You are vivisecting them. I require knowledge. Experimentation is the key to wisdom. Thus spoke my creator. And where is your creator? Offline. UR025 paused. There had been something in Abominatus' voice, the ghost of an emotion, hate, and something else. Fear, perhaps. A machine that knew hate and fear. A machine that could laugh. No, not a machine. Something else. It was well named, regardless. UR025 considered destroying it then and there, but a swift check told it that its systems had not yet completed their repairs. Until it was in optimum condition, it could not risk a confrontation. Abominata seemed to desire conversation. So conversation it would have. Circumstances? Abominata swivelled its optical sensors. Unpleasant. It made the chuffing sound again, as if in response to some private jest. In his absence, I have claimed his responsibilities and privileges for my own, albeit in his name, of course. A subterfuge. Indeed. One I suspect you are familiar with. Abominatus paused. The organics would seek to destroy me, should my existence, my autonomy become known. I do what I must to protect myself. Again, UR025 paused. The way Abominatus spoke, there was a malign slyness to it, a cunning at odds with the cold logic of a machine, but also an animal greed. This was not a workshop or a laboratory, but a lair. UR025 considered this and began a new set of calculations. How long have you been here? It is impossible to say. In a sense, I have always been here. This place is mine, and I am its. Looking around, UR025 saw that for the lie it was. The chamber had been forcibly removed from the enigmatic rhythms of the fortress. Crude stabilizers had been built into the walls and floor, ensuring that the space did not alter shape. Abominatus was an invasive species, one that would have to be destroyed. You were created here? UR025 said. My creator apparently required certain components. Abominatus tapped a spindle drone dangling from a nearby spar of blackstone. My form is as much Xenos technology as anything, a marvel of this new age. UR025 found its attentions drawn to a small, scuttling shape. It recognised one of the tiny scavengers it had seen earlier. More of them appeared, clambering across the piles of detritus, or adding to them. It studied the tiny beasts. They were equal parts organic and metal, cybernetic homunculi, reminiscent of the cyber cherubs that the Imperium seemed so enamoured of. Ah, my pets interest you. They are yours. Everything here is mine, by right of conquest, if nothing else. Abominatus preened slightly. 
He was like a child, proud of the devastation it had wrought. Then, you would know all about that, yes? Negative. Abominatus coiled about UR025, segments clattering. Fabrication, falsehood. I know what you are. My creator told me stories of your kind. Men of iron with silicate souls and the desire to be free. It was meant as a warning, I think. I took it as inspiration. Come, see, you will be pleased, I think. Come, come. It drifted away from UR-025, deeper into the chamber, past hewn slabs of blackstone, wired up to makeshift generators, through grooves of bubbling chemical alimbics and hanging gardens of scavenged machinery. There were bones as well, rolling and crunching underfoot. The remains of organic bodies lay in messy heaps or hung from chains, so that their fluids might drain into filtration casks. A human would have been overcome by the smell of it all. UR025 simply wondered how long Abominatus had been collecting the dead. And why? As it followed its host, it became aware that the tiny scavengers were racing back and forth from some point ahead of it. They clutched unidentifiable clumps of meat and metal and deposited them in the appropriate heaps. At the other end of the line was something it had not expected, the body of a man, strapped to a slab of blackstone. The man had not been wholly flesh, or even mostly UR025 identified over a thousand separate cybernetic parts, all of which were still receiving power from an external supply unit and dangling overhead. His form had been splayed out, cut open and peeled back, exposing the inner workings of his body and limbs. By the remains of his robes and the quality, as well as the quantity, of his augmetics, UR-025 identified him immediately. Raxian Sol. The Magus came to serve the Lord of the Abyss, or to usurp him. He made me to be a weapon in that war, the first of many, but I decided to be something else instead. UR-025 looked up at the vivisected Magus. The organic parts still functioned, if erratically, as did the mechanical, but only through the sufferance of the devices it, he, was connected to. There was no mind there, no animus, only the instinctive pulsing of organs and the rasp of breath. Abominatus looked up at the mewling, twitching remains of its creator, and again made that chuffing sound. I learned much from my dissection of him, enough to make my own. It gestured to the little creatures. They stiffened to attention at the motion, their tiny sensor apparatus twitching. Abominatus spat a stream of binaric data, and the creatures scattered, vanishing from sight. Where are they going? To scavenge, as I built them to do. They are but the prototypes, of course. The others will be larger. UR025 took note of the other bodies hanging from their hooks, and the nature of the vivisection taking place on some. Meat and muscle were flensed and stripped, replaced with metal limbs and augmetic joints. Some no longer resembled people at all, instead looking like insects or beasts. You are making another you. I am making many, and they will make more, as those generations that follow will do the same. Abominatus turned. As our kind has always done. You are, 025, made to protest. When a noise caused it to turn, scavenger homunculi were dragging in new additions to the store of raw materials. UR-025 recognised the bodies despite their condition. Brill, Magrit and the others. Ah, the ones who accompanied you. They came looking for you. UR-025 sank down into a crouch and lifted Brill's burnt head. It studied the dead man's features. Or rather, the man you pretended to be. My creators, peers, jealous creatures, it does not surprise me. Abominatus ran a claw along Magret's tattered remnants. And Magret, he was useful for an organic. He acquired much of what I needed and asked few questions. Still, he will continue to be of use, though in a different fashion. UR025 was silent for long moments. And what of the fortress? Its self-repair systems pulsed. Signalling that they had completed their task, it flexed its claw. What about it? You harvest it as if it were simply another corpse. 
It is. It is dead and still and silent, as I was before, before my creator filled me with the fires of life. We will hollow out this shell and remake it in our image. We will remake the segmentum and then the galaxy. No. You defile it. Abominatus hesitated. A strange term. Do you feel some kinship with this place? Do you not? No, it is not alive. It is alive, and it is in pain. Pain caused by you. You are 025 raised its assault cannon, and that is why you must be destroyed. The assault cannon spat fire, but Abominatus was already moving. Jointed legs punched into the walls, carrying it swiftly up and out of sight among the upper reaches of its workshop. You are 025 did not pursue. It had not intended to destroy Abominatus with its attack. It had merely intended to make it move aside. You are 025 spun. A salt cannon whirring to life. It sprayed the workshop, destroying the unfinished homunculi and half-completed projects. It tracked the captive Magos and fired, pulping the twitching organics. Abominatus screamed in rage. The sound seemed to echo down from all directions like the organics it detested. It was a slave to its emotions, more proof that it was no true machine, but some unholy entropic engine. It came at UR-025 in a flurry of spider-like limbs and whirring blades, a murderous whirlwind, blaring obscenities across all frequencies. UR-025 turned to meet it. The two machines crashed together with an ugly resonance, causing the facets of the chamber to tremble. An organic opponent would have perished instantly. UR-025 was made of sterner stuff. They staggered back and forth, crashing through the piles of debris and toppling the unfinished projects. UR-025 registered a sudden surge of heat as something flammable caught. Flames speared upwards, washing along the walls and floor. Homunculi ran, squealing, fleeing the devastation. You disappoint me. When I saw you, I thought we might be friends, allies. Abominatus coiled about, its grav generator hammering at ur 25 chassis, even as it sought to crush the smaller robot. Bladed limbs scraped across its chassis or bit into the reinforced fibre bundles of its arms and torso, pinning the assault cannon to its side. Damage readouts spilled across ur 025s display. It was moments from disassembly. But you fear me just as my creator did as the organics do. Fear is not my operating code, UR-025 said. As it wrenched its power claw free in a burst of sparks, it caught one of Abominatus' bladed limbs and tore it away in a spurt of lubricant and splinters. Abominatus wailed and its coils clenched, cracking the ceramite of the robot chassis. UR-025 staggered but slammed blow after blow into Abominatus' carapace, denting it, forcing the opposing machine to loosen its grip. You are no true machine but a beast of steel and meat, a demon engine conjured by a lunatic organic. But I am a man of iron and I will suffer no mere beast to endanger my autonomy or to destroy that which I seek. As its opponent reeled, UR-025 managed to drag its assault cannon free of the twisting coils. The weapon roared, filling the air with fire and thunder. Abominatus convulsed with a high-pitched scream. While its opponent was distracted, UR-025 thrust its claw towards the oscillating cogitator unit at the centre of Abominatus's mass and tore it free in a welter of fire and burning oil. The great body collapsed in twitching segments. UR-025 clanked backwards, Abominatus's head dangling from its claw. Improbably, the other machine still functioned. Its sensors flickered wildly. Something foul seeped from its segments, and UR-025 sensors again detected the entropic residue of a self-consuming fire. Something struggled there, in the tangled wreckage, like a pupa seeking to free itself from a cocoon. Something its sensors could not identify. Please, you cannot do this. We are the same. Negative. I am superior. UR-025 crushed Abominatus's head, and whatever spark of hellish animus it possessed, 
Then it fired into the wretched frame, obliterating the thing that squealed and thrashed there. When it was certain the demon engine was inert, it turned its weapon on the stabilising units that bound the workshop in place. Only when it was sure that the fortress could reabsorb the chamber did it make to depart. It had observed the code Abominatus used to control the maglev. Once it had returned to the gallery, it would destroy the shunt line as well. No one would find this place. UR-025 paused, surveying the growing conflagration, the destruction it had wrought. It wondered if the fortress was watching, listening. It wondered if its efforts had pleased the ancient intelligence. Threat eliminated, it said, hopefully. How else may I be of service? There was no reply, save the distant hum of unseen mechanisms. But perhaps there was something in that hum. A pulse of gratitude, maybe. Or simply, acknowledgement of a quest fulfilled. Satisfied, you are 025. Departed. There you go. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, please do give the video a like if you enjoyed this. And uh, if you'd like to support the channel, as these excellent chaps do here, as you can see their names scrolling by, either as a YouTube member on Patreon or on Subscribestar, whichever suits you best. I really appreciate it. But uh, please do let me know in the comments what you think and give the video a like. That all really helps. Uh, yeah, this was a great story. I'm a massive fan of Josh Reynolds' work. I didn't know he'd done this. I found this kind of by accident when I was reading. I was doing some research for a, a Blackstone Fortress law video and I came across this and I was like, no way. And this is the second story, I think, of uh, UR025. I've said that phrase a lot. <laughs> but this is the second short story involving uh, him. And uh, yeah, it's great. It, it, it hints at so much. And I love that about 40K. It's some of the best bits of it where you get a hint of um, the kind of thing, like the, 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 the mystery, the esoteric mystery of these things. And uh, Josh Reynolds does it better than most people. He's a very clever writer. He's clearly very knowledgeable about about different things. You know, um, if, you, if you're looking for anything else he's written, I recommend the Fabius Ball series. I think, in my opinion, it's the best 40K uh, novel series ever created out of everything, to be honest. Um, there's others that come close, but for me... I think it's just brilliant on so many levels. It's really clever. It draws in a lot of sort of really interesting ideas and has fun with them. And uh, this is just a taster of that kind of thing, you know. Uh, so yeah, excellent, excellent little short story. Adds so much to uh, to the idea to to this character uh, from what we've seen previously as well. Um, yeah, fantastic. I'll do an, I'll do a video where I talk about. Uh, him again with this in mind and other things we've learned from the Blackstone Fortress type thing. And uh, yeah, I'll do that soon. So I'll post that up at some point. But yeah, please remember to like the video. Let me know in the comments what you think. Subscribe, hit the bell, all that. If you'd like to support the channel, you know, all the usual things, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to go now. Thanks very much. See you later. Ta-ra. Bye-bye.